welcome to the May program of the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II History Roundtable, the final program of our 26th year. Thank you for coming. Well, this, is, this evening's program is one of the tragic events of um, World War II. Uh, Comp Group Piper was the lead element of the attack on the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, this is one of the episodes that, that happened. Uh, our speaker this evening is Danny Parker, who I'll uh, say more about here briefly. We're then going to <coughs> have three veterans sit up here. Uh, Jerry Noss, who was uh, in the signal company for the 1st Infantry Division. Merle Bergstaller, that was in a AAA unit with the uh, 6th Armored Division, and Howie Flynn, uh, who is, of course, always working at the counter. Give him respect, please. He, we need him. But Howie had a great encounter that uh, we want to have relate to you. So um, uh, as I've gotten to know Danny, he grew up in North Carolina went to school in Montana, and uh, currently lives in Cocoa Beach, Florida. He developed this great interest in the Battle of the Bulge as a child. Uh, it has grown from this, and, and uh, <clears throat> as we have discussed some of his encounters with the, the likes of Charles McDonald and, and many of the Hugh Cole and many of the people that those of you that have read World War II history recognize uh, from the center of military history uh, in the uh, 40s, 50s, and I guess into the 60s. But Danny, um, uh, w w w I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming. The Battle of the Bulge always attracts a great audience. And the, we've got some experts. Now, I don't want to challenge you here, but we've got some great people. So, Danny Parker, uh, welcome to Minnesota. Welcome to uh, the World War II Roundtable, and I turn the floor over to you, sir. It's really my pleasure to be here this evening and to talk to you all about uh, something I've worked on for a long time. And uh, used to, when I was a lot younger, people would ask me, you're a young man. How did you ever get interested in this? <laughs> But now they don't ask me that anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I'll, tell a, I'll tell a little story to start things off. So uh, several years ago, actually more than several years ago, I was over in Belgium. And I've, uh, for, for this book, I've done probably about 100 interviews with various people. And, but I've done more than 200 interviews in uh, uh, on another book I'm working on now. But anyway, I was in Belgium interviewing a woman and she was telling me about her travails during the Battle of the Bulge and how her family escaped from home and you know, and they had to you know, uh, cross a river and how difficult it was. And, and it's a pretty interesting story. But anyway, and I was taping all this and I tape all these interviews. <clears throat> and uh, at the end of the interview, she looks at me and she says, you know, you look pretty good for having been in the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> and I look back carefully at her to see if her glasses really looked like they were working OK. <laughs> so but anyway, it's really been a, a, a grand thing for me to be able to, to research World War II. And why I became involved with this, I became interested in that time uh, when I was a young man. And one thing led to another. I ended up uh, spending a lot of my, uh, believe it or not, high school summers at the National Archives in Washington, DC. It's a long story as to how all that happened. I'm not going to go into how that occurred, but it did. And so I got to know a lot of people there. They said, there's this kid that comes in the summer. And he knows a lot about the records at the National Archives. And so I was in, and once you start research like this, where you really learn something about a battle in World War II or something, you know a lot about it, 
you can never quit it. Because like th I thought, well, I'm done with that now. I'm, I was off in graduate school doing completely different stuff, and I got a call. It's George Wagner, a German fellow who I know from, knew from the National Archives. He said, I have someone that's, that really wants to talk to you, but we're not allowed to give out somebody's name and contact information without permission. I, I said, who is it? He said, Charles McDonald. <laughs> I said, you can do that then. <laughs> so Charles McDonald was the chief of military history for the US Army. Uh, in Washington, and he was starting to work on a new book called A Time for Trumpets that a lot of you probably know about. I'm proud to be able to call Charles a good friend of mine. We toured the Ardennes. We led several tours over there. I worked for him for several years trying to help him with preparations for that book and then did something on my own. But then each time I'd say, I'm done with that, and it just keeps coming back. And so now I've just decided I'm never done with that. So you're the first audience I've ever told that I'm never done with that. <laughs> When, I, when I'm done with that, you know I'll not, I'm not around anymore. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> I started working uh, uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, one of the things that happened with Charles McDonald was uh, I, in a conversation we had over um, several glasses of wine, I believe, in Belgium, he mentioned to me on the Battle of the Bulge that he felt that if you could understand this, this German fellow, Joachim Piper, who was in charge of the battle group that perpetrated the Malmini massacre, and you're going to learn about that in just a moment. But he thought, said, if you could understand that guy, I think you could understand the entire war from the other side. And I paid attention to what he was saying. And I actually started looking into that, and I decided he's absolutely right. That if, that if you understand the life of this man, it's in a microcosm, you understand what went wrong in World War II from the German side, and then how, how all that took place. Uh, but as I delved into that, I learned about this central event in this person's career, the Malmody Massacre, and it was really a terrible thing. And I also learned that there was a lot of confusion about it. And uh, so one thing led to another, and uh, eventually my uh, publisher said, let's take the stuff that you've already got on the Malmody Massacre that you've developed within what you've been working on, and let's turn that into a separate book. And I said, that's a great idea because, you know, this, otherwise this project's taken 20 years and it would be nice to, to have something finally come out of it. So it did. Uh, this was, the book was published uh, a year ago. And I'm, I'm, I have to say, after, you know, oftentimes when I write books or I do books, I've said, that was okay, but it could be a little better or what, that's not so good. But this one, actually, I, I still feel good about this book. And I especially feel good uh, about the fact that I spoke to a lot of American fellows who are no longer here today, who entrusted me with their story. And I said, I will preserve your story. And it is. It's preserved in this book for now and for future generations. So this story is maintained. And I think to understand our lives today, we need to understand our heritage, where we came from, how it all happened, what occurred. And so, uh, you know. That's why I think it's so important for everyone that knows a veteran to try to get that veteran to, rather than just tell the grandchildren, to actually try to get things on tape or write it down or something else like that. So I'll stop with that, but I do think that this is extremely important. So let's go back in time to November 1944. And I've spent a lot of time at the archives, and this is actually a German propaganda leaflet. You can see it's not in such perfect condition, but it was dropped, it was dropped over Eupen in Belgium, just north of where the Malmody Massacre took place. It was dropped in November 1944. And uh, it was dropped before uh, voting, and then here we have uh, Franklin Roosevelt not looking so good. <laughs> So in terms of the prop propaganda saying, you know, hurry up, American soldiers, uh, and don't miss your vote. You know, so, so basically it was, it was trying to exploit, uh, you know, feelings about, mixed feelings about voting, which I was kind of interested in when I looked this up. You know, this happened not too far from the previous election. I was thinking some things have not changed that much. There's a lot of strong feelings about some of these things. But anyway, this was dropped over, over, uh, Eupen, but basically, uh, at that time, in November 1944, 
a lot of things had happened so that, that uh, Hitler's Germany was on the cusp of, of defeat, really. And I'm not going to go through the history of the invasion of Normandy and so forth, but I'm going to tell you that these things did happen. So uh, we came ashore on D-Day, uh, June 1944, and the beachheads expanded. And then by November, we were along this, roughly along the German border. We had reached that point. We had liberated uh, Paris uh, in August, and then we were on the so-called Siegfried Line. Here you see the dragon's teeth, uh, two soldiers overlooking the, uh, the Ur River right, at, right in the Ardennes, uh, where the Battle of the Bulge was fought on the other side. And it, it looks like a fairly peaceful event in this case, but this was, this was in September. And so a lot of you know a lot about this, and I won't go through the details, but essentially the advance, the, the beachhead fighting was terrible. There were a lot of uh, casualties. By December 1944, by the time the Battle of the Bulge happened, there had been a quarter of a million casualties suffered by the American forces fighting in France. And so we think about, you know, the casualties that we have in Afghanistan or in some other conflict. And, you know, this, I'm not saying the other wars are not real. I'm not telling you that. But I was saying this was a really all-consuming, terrible war. Uh, and, so, and in November alone, when that leaflet was dropped, com, uh, saying, you know, exploiting feelings about casualties, there were lots of them. In the month of November alone, 60,000 casualties in the Hurricane Forest fighting. And so, so things were not going so well. Basically, we had been able to get to the German border uh, in September, but not really move much further from that. And then every attempt at pushing further seemed to meet stronger and stronger resistance. And so um, the, the real question was, uh, exactly when would the war end? So how did the average GI look at the situation? Were they thinking about all these things about the strategy and how things were going and so forth? Now, uh, Eisenhower had a bet going with Field Marshal Montgomery that the war would be over by Christmas 1944. That bet had been made the previous summer. Uh, and so Montgomery contacted Eisenhower in December and said, it's time to pay up. <laughs> so, and he, and this, but this was early. He said, so it's not Christmas yet, and I'll, you'll get your money, but not a day before. But, the, you know, not only was Eisenhower thinking about uh, the fact that they had not been able to win the war by Christmas time, but a lot of soldiers that were very lonely and ne had never been away from home were very far away and wishing that they were back home. And this is, I found this again at the National Archives, but this shows what people, you know, these are magazines from that month. So you get to see what the, was on the thoughts of people living then. What were they thinking about? Were they thinking about the war? No, they were thinking about, I want to be home. This was, this was, you know, and this, the door to home. And then there were these casualties that a lot of Americans ha had been uh, hurt in the fighting. This is Marlena Dietrich, who was doing USO shows to try to cheer everybody up. On the eve of the, when the Battle of the Bulge occurred on December 16, 1944, she was scheduled to appear in Hansfeld. And uh, it was almost impossible to get leave to get to Hansfeld. It was like the ticket master of the day. There was no way to get, there was no way to get to that town. But actually, she never appeared because when she was scheduled to appear, the Battle of the Bulge had actually happened the day before. So she was, but uh, this is what people were really thinking about in terms of soldiers. That's what they were thinking. They were thinking about the war seems to be done. We've been sitting on this front. Nothing's been happening. So in the Ardennes, on either side of the Ardennes fighting, in the Hurricane Forest to the north and the Lorraine area to the south, there had been a heavy, heavy fighting. But in the Ardennes area, it was, it was considered the ghost front, the quiet area, where nothing's happening and nothing's going to happen because it's heavily forest and heavily wooded, and no one in their right mind would attack here. And the Germans have not attacked 
in winter in the entire history of the war. They always, they're a summer army. They like to fight in the summer, except then. That was the one time. <clears throat> so this says something about, you know, when people say it's never happened before in betting and various things, that just means that it's just never happened before. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. So to make sure you understand what the Malmody massacre was before you leave this evening, I thought I'd put this slide up front before, you know, people fall asleep. I always like to give the information, the key information up front before, you know, that way at least if you leave or, or you doze off and someone said, wasn't that good or terrible or whatever, you say, oh, at least I heard something. Anyway, <laughs> so what was it? Uh, in the Battle of the Bulge, which began on December 16, 1944, the German forces were at their idea, Hitler's idea in terms of why to launch an attack in the Western Front in the dead of winter in a terrible area that was heavily forested, big hills, bad roads. Why attack there? The idea was to slice through the American lines, reach the coast, cut off the British Army, leave part of the uh, First Army without any supply, stop the war for months, and then transfer forces to the Eastern Front and deal with that. Well, on December 17th, passing by this little crossroads, this is a period topographic map, this, this little town it looks like if you were an American, you'd say it's Bognez. In French, it's pronounced Bonnier. This little, it's not a town, it's just a crossroads. At this crossroads, German forces that were coming down this road ran into an American field artillery observation battalion that was coming down this road, and they ran into each other at that intersection. The Germans saw them coming down this road and started firing from over here, back at them uh, before they got there. They were captured, 150 American prisoners were captured. A field artillery observation battalion was a kind of unit that never was supposed to ever run into the enemy. They were, they're, they're, they were the smart weapons of November, December 1944. Their idea was through sound and flash ranging, uh, you were going to use triangulation you were going to use trigonometry, you know that. Trigonometry really can do things. But anyway, they were going to use trigonometry to actually determine where the enemy was firing from. And then once you knew where they were firing from, you just pass the coordinates to the big guns. And then those people were sorry they were ever firing because there were a lot more guns coming at them. So that's what, but otherwise, you did that from behind the lines. You never were in the front lines. So the. Most of the men in the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion maybe had a pistol. They probably had a rifle in the truck. There were two bazookas in the entire battery. There was one machine gun. There was no tanks. A lot of the guys, and I talked to them, I interviewed them, they said, oh yeah, we fired rifles. We hadn't fired them, you know, some, we hadn't fired a lot of that stuff. We haven't fired since basic training. You know, we weren't, there wasn't, you know, now, one guy, Ted Poluchno, said, yeah, I, fired, I was firing every week. He was, you know, he was a hunter. He was after venison. And it, unfortunately, it sounds like he was taking advantage of some of the la local um, uh, cattle in Belgium. <laughs> and he, he also he said, you know, if you found this guy, Lanahan was his name. If you could find Lanahan, there were stakes. Thanks close by that guy. Anyway, so, so he, he was one of the people that actually knew how to fire his weapon commonly, but they ran into these Americans that were behind the lines, didn't expect to run into the Germans at all, ran into them, were made prisoner, and then they were gunned down by this SS tank column, and 84 were killed. 84 were killed. Now, about 150 so were there, so a lot of survivors played dead. They played dead. So they, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that to make sure that you understand some things that you may see uh, today in uh, other accounts or videos. Like, do any of you know the, the movie Saints and Soldiers that was out years ago? You know, but you've seen that? So I want to tell you that the depiction of the Malmody Massacre and Saints and Soldiers, whereas Saints and Soldiers looks really good in terms of its depiction, it's really completely wrong in terms of what happened at the, at the Malmody Massacre. Because at the Malmody Massacre, no one ran. 
No one really ran there, and I'll, I'll describe to you why in a little bit. But it, was a, it became a controversial event, which is why I decided to write the book. After the war, uh, the people who did this, that shot these Americans down, started working on, hard on changing the story so that it would, they could absolve the Germans who had did, done this from being guilty and to get out of prison or to, keep, to escape being hung and so forth. This is uh, what the crossroads looked like. So the Germans came from here. Here's, this is a little uh, crossroads of Bonnier. Here's the cafe right here, which was uh, the Germans came across here. The, the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion was coming down here. The Germans fired from over here. The traffic stopped on this road. When the Germans arrived, then they were, the Americans were taken prisoner. The head of that tank column was this man, that I, the, the man that I was studying, that's kind of the microcosm of what happened in, in uh, Germany and the war. And his name was Jochen Piper. He, this is uh, Piper receiving the uh, oak leaves to the Knights Cross on February, in February 1944 uh, from Hitler himself in uh, the Wolfslayer in East Prussia. This is the, the members of the tank column advancing uh, and you can see Malmody is 13 kilometers away. This happened, you know, this is a period photograph. So this, the, this is not Piper, as some people have said. Well, it's, it's not him. But this gives you an idea of what things looked like. I put this picture in so you can see kind of the way things looked when this happened, when the Americans were taken prisoner at this, col at this crossroads. This shows a German King Tiger tank passing by prisoners actually taken from the US 99th Infantry Division near the, near the village of Merelscheid uh, the, the same day that this happened. These guys were lucky. They're walking back to Germany. And this shows the way they were, you know, this, this is the way Americans surrendered. This is the way it looked when you saw Americans surrendering. This was taken by an SS Kriegsberichter, who was basically a photographer who took f photographs of good events that you wanted to use for propaganda back home. King Tiger passing by a lot of prisoners made in the Battle of the Bulge. So this is what it looked like. That's when, the, when, the, when those guys surrendered, this is what it would have looked like in terms of when they were walking back to the crossroads. Now they were shot down. And what was, what was found later after all this happened. The Germans kept moving, and they advanced past this crossroads in the Battle of the Bulge and kept moving forward west. Heavy snows fell. Believe it or not, even though in Saints and Soldiers or whatever, you'll see the snow on the ground. And most people that think there was snow on the ground when the Malmody Massacre happened, there was no snow on the ground. It was muddy. It was cold. It was about 40 degrees. It would be kind of like typical weather here last week, what it sounds like. <laughs> Well, maybe it wasn't. Someone told me it was snowing here last week. Is that right? <laughs> so anyway, this, this is when the, the in, on uh, January 12th, 1945, the American 30th Infantry Division recaptured that crossroads. And a photographer took this, snapped this picture, which showed this field marked off limits, which is it was under investigation. Don't go there. This is what could be seen. There were these lumps that you could see under the snow. These were actually the bodies in the field. But Lieutenant Colonel Alvin B. Welch, who was an inspector from the uh, US First Army, was appointed by Eisenhower himself after this happened to go and investigate that. And this is Welch himself with two medical officers uncovering these bodies and examining each one. And then they were photographed. Uh, all their dog tags and all kinds of other information gathered uh, and then diagrammed in terms of where they were located because this had moved from, uh, uh, this had become a big deal in terms, and there was a, a formal uh, objection, or I don't know, maybe objection's probably not the right word. There was, through, the, through Switzerland, the US said the Germans are executing soldier, uh, uh, prisoners in this operation in the Ardennes. And so uh, this had already happened. So they were really trying to document exactly what happened. 
And so one of the things they found was that a lot of these men had been, and then here you see them uncovering the bodies, and then they were removed for an autopsy in a building uh, in Malmody. But a lot of these men had been shot uh, at some distance, but a lot of them had been executed at, from close range. You could see powder burns on their head. You know, so they had, not only had they been shot, but later than they had been executed after being wounded. So there was a US RV investigation. And there was a detailed evaluation of the causes of death. These are the three uh, grim-faced doctors who performed the autopsy on these men. And uh, this soldier is pointing to an uh, exit wound on the, uh, the head uh, private first class flak. These are, these are records that I obtained and made copies to be able to show you what the original records look like at the National Archives. I thought this was uh, pretty interesting. This is, this is Eisenhower's reaction after he found out. This photograph was taken uh, in, at the end of November, just before all this happened. Uh, <clears throat> the night when the Battle of the Bulge began, Eisenhower was getting his latest new star. And he had, there was a big party going on at the, the, uh, his headquarters in Versailles near Paris. Really uh, nice place. And he had his favorite me meal, which was uh, uh, grits and oysters. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> how many grits and oysters? So, and ho polished up a Highland Piper Scotch. So that was that was what what uh, he preferred. But anyway, so here it is, and this is this is urgent telegram dated 22nd December from uh, the Euro th European Theater of Operations to U.S. First Army, describing exactly what happened. Where, uh, according to, to uh, newspapers, they were, the Americans were assembled in the field, stripped of their possessions, and then this atrocity occurred. And then this is the way the newspapers covered it. This is the day after what was, what, what Stars and Stripes were saying about what happened. And then the, uh, we, one thing that was clear in December of 1944, we ruled the air. Even though the Germans had launched this attack under the cover of clouds and bad weather, eventually the the weather cleared. And this is a, a photograph that I found at the National Archives. It was taken of the crossroads on 24 December 1944. And this is, someone has written on the photograph. This is the scene of the atrocity. This is where it happened. It was snapped from up above. There was a trial after the war about what happened. And this is one of the reasons to write the book. Because the trial investigated, uh, there was a big, uh, what would you call it, a dragnet, where they said, if you were a member of the 1st SS Panzer Division in the war, at the end of the war, we want to see you. We want to talk to you. And then not only do we want to talk to you, we want to put you in a special place where we're going to later figure out which one of you we're really interested in talking to. There were about 500, build 500 people in that original sweep. But then they, they eventually narrowed it down to approximately 80 or 90 people that they felt probably were perpetrators involved in this incident. And there was a trial that was set, staged at Dachau uh, in Germany after the war. Why was Dachau chosen? Poetic justice for the concentration camp that had been there prior. But here's the thing, these men, this shows uh, the ranking commander at Bonnier, at that crossroads when this when this atrocity happened, was a man by the lieutenant by the name of Lieutenant uh, Virgil T. Larry. That was his name. This is Larry, and he said he remembered this was the man who fired the first shot to the in into the group of prisoners that were standing by the crossroads. So this was a dramatic moment at the trial. Uh, there were many uh, of the uh, 80 to 90 odd defendants that were in that trial, uh, a large number of them were sentenced to death. Uh, none of them were never were ever executed. So, and then there were 
But it was a controversial trial. And again, it's like history does seem to repeat itself. It's so strange. Even though the US Army worked at trying to gather these guys together and find the ones that were guilty, they assigned it to people that it may not have been the best choice in terms of the prosecutor or the defender. They assigned the, the guy who was going to defend these Germans was a lawyer from Atlanta who had uh, only civil legal experience. He'd only dealt with divorce trials. <laughs> he had dealt with divorce trials prior. And, he had, and basically, the army told him in a, in a very oh, uh, underhanded way that the fact that you won't be able to defend these guys won't be held against your record. That's essentially what he was being told. OK, so that's, that's him. His name was Willis Everett. And then there was another fellow. The prosecuting attorney was this man. His name was Burton Ellis. And he said, this is my chance for true fame and glory. And I'm going to see that all these guys, you know. He was, Nuremberg trials were going at the same time. He really wanted headlines. He wanted headlines. And so he was overreaching. He was basically trying to. He had them shooting everybody everywhere, not only just at Bonnier. He had all these other incidents happening. Uh, it, it's, it becomes hard to believe almost. But so, so what he did, what Ellis did, was did all kinds of crazy things uh, to threaten the, the Germans during the investigation to get them to talk, like threatening their parents with, with holding rationing cards, this sort of thing. Not a good idea or mock trials that weren't really real. Now, were these things really uh, abuse and torture? Waterboarding? No. Th these, these were nothing like that. But it was not a good way to run a trial. And so, so what happened is the, the incompetent lawyer from Atlanta said, even though I'm, I know nothing about this, I'm, gonna, I'm somehow going to, there's a thing called the writ of habeas corpus, and I'm going to submit it to the, to the Supreme Court. And he did that. And even though these guys were guilty, he said, even though they were guilty, it had, none of them received a fair trial. And he was like a champion of the little guy. They picked the wrong guy. And then the, the guy, Burton Ellis, that was in charge of the prosecution, he was like a hard drinking guy who basically just wanted to get, get famous and then get out of there. So anyway, uh, then. I have to move along. But then what happens? Then Joe McCarthy enters the picture. <laughs> Remember Joe McCarthy? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not even that old, no. But, but Joe McCarthy f said, this is a way to really get some traction for me. You know, like there were improprieties like Abu Ghraib happened before sort of thing. So we're, you know, he said, let's have Senate hearings. And he did. And it was great for his career. You know, uh, next stop, Joe McCarthy, tail gunner Joe. Anyway, but so then the SS guys, after all that happened, it like gave, it like fueled the fire. It's like stoking the fire. Like you had these, the way the trial was being handled poorly, then uh, they start telling stories, trying to change the story. And that's the reason I decided to write the book. This is called, I call it, revisionism, you know, where you try to revise history to fit what your motives are. So my, my question in writing the book was, what really happened? What, what really happened? So uh, this is what the crossroads looked like. This is the scene that you saw in Saints and Soldiers. This is a, a picture that was drawn and appeared in Stars and Stripes soon thereafter about what one of the, the men uh, who had been in this group, what he saw, what he remembered. So this may be more of like what happened than what this was. But the other thing is that none of the men uh, ran. And this is a key point. So the concept for this book was the post-war apologist, I wanted to steal them. They would, if you listen to the old SS guys as time went on, it didn't even happen. Somehow, 84, 84 Americans killed themselves at the crossroads, you know, or they were killed by artillery or some, you know, it, it just becomes, it begs you to be, to, I don't know, you just have to be incredibly naive. I'm not that naive to believe that. So I wanted to say, let's tell the full story of what happened at Malmody. So I did research in, in the US National Archives and the German Archives over many years to try, and I interviewed over 100 witnesses, American, 
Yes, and I spoke to German witnesses too. And Belgian. Belgian witnesses were the very best ones because, one, it happened in their backyard. They knew what was happening in their backyard. Two, they were kids. Kids will tell you what they see. Three, they had no specific ax to grind in what they described. And I spoke to the two, two of the witnesses were the, the first time anybody had talked to them. There were two boys, one named Robert Pfeiffer and the other Peter Lentz. And they, they told me what they saw. And then I used, uh, uh, I used what I call a forensic research methods, which is let's recreate the battle scene, let's get all the stories, put them all together, and then use what I call triangulation, which is one person says something, maybe. Two people say something, probably. Three people agree on the story that don't know each other or haven't had a chance to talk. Now you're somewhere. That's the method I use for doing this. And this is Bill Merrikin, who if any of you have been reading the book, he's really features in my story, right? Because why does he feature in my story? Because the man, even though I'm sad to say Bill is no longer living, he shouldn't have even been living after this happened. His story is kind of an amazing one in terms of how he was able to survive. He was standing right near the front of that group. And what happened when the Germans started firing from half tracks that were parked next to that group? Did they try to run? Did they try to spread out, defend themselves? As some of the SS apologists said, they tried to grab rifles. They didn't have any rifles. They were disarmed. They all fell to the ground. If you have people shooting at you and it's really close by, like from here to the middle row, you don't try to run when they start shooting. You try to get out of the way of bullets because people are falling in front of you. So this is what happens. So this is, uh, this is Bill Merrikin when I went with him in, in uh, I think this was 2004. This is back at Bonnier. And then this is an account that was written in, in February. He was really badly wounded. So the account he wrote at the National Archives, uh, he couldn't write right after that because he was so badly wounded. He was in the hospital recuperating. I also spoke to German participants. This is Hans Siptrot, who was in charge of the, the tank where that first man supposedly shot from. This is Hans Siptrot just a year ago when I visited him when I was passing through Germany again. He hasn't changed his story. He's never denied that this happened. So this is a man named Manfred Torn. This is the way he looked then. This is the way he looks now. Uh, and he was right ahead of the other Germans that, that did this. He was just ahead of them. And he, he never denied that this happened either. Never denied that it happened. This is Peter Lentz, who was on a bicycle riding. Uh, I think he was going to the dentist. This is worse than ending up at the dentist. So, so, so he was riding his bicycle. And at that, at that crossroads, he ran into the German column coming. And they shot to America, at the, the beginning of the column, they shot two Americans that were in the ditch right by him. And this is his interrogation that was done in 1945 of him, where they chose not to have him at the trial because he was too young. But he was from the area around Manderfeld in Belgium, where German is spoken. And he said uh, they, were, they had shot two Americans that were in the ditch by him, and they get, turned the weapons on him. And he, he said, my brother's in the German army. I'm German. You're about to shoot another German. And they put their weapons down and said, get out of here. So and that he survived. He's still living today. And then this is uh, some of the old German, other German veterans that I interviewed. Uh, the descriptions, that, the pictures they drew of the crossroads, where the ha how the tanks were lined up in the half tracks. Here are the Americans by the crossroads, there's that cafe that was eventually burned down. And again, this is at the, at the archives itself. So this is their own, this is Siptrot's own drawing, this guy's own drawing from that time about what happened. And then uh, we spent a lot of time in the archives. This is a woman who's helped me, still helping me in Germany. Her hands, name is Ann Shields. And she'll, uh, she's really great in terms of helping with research. But we, we dealt with a lot of records, and we looked at a lot of things. And we had a lot of things declassified, too.
And so we again use this method of multiple witnesses with, and a lot of these witnesses had drawings, detailed, the Germans, you know, you'd say like, even though they were claiming this didn't happen, after it happened, when they were apprehended, they drew really detailed, I mean like not a drawing like I would do. My, mine are like chicken scratch. These are really detailed drawings where they have a legend that tells you exactly what happened, who was there. It's like, you know, uh, so anyway, there were, there were really good records for this. So one of the problems with, if you know German people, and I, please don't feel offended if I say this, but German people keep really good records, usually. And so if you keep really good records and you're doing something bad, it doesn't work out well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, this is an American story. This is an American um, that was writing about what happened to him. Uh, as the commander of this tank outfit, uh, uh, they, they searched us and took away all our valuables, watches and so forth. And then they herded us into this field with a wired fence. And then we're all together with our hands up facing the highway uh, at a distance of uh, just over, what is that, 50 feet? 60, 60 feet, and then from there, as we stood there facing the tanks, a German officer stood up inside his tank and fired a pistol, and he aimed, and then he fired his pistol again. Anyway, this all happened right here. So, and I basically used these records that I got from the National Archives with these detailed drawings by the Germans to help cre recreate this from the artists that worked in creating the maps for the book. And then we assess the aftermath, like we determine from all, you know, from Al, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alvin Welsh, who they determined where all the bodies were, we found where all, I located all these, so you could see exactly where they're located. Do they look like they were running? If they were running, they would be spread out in a teardrop shape going out like this. They weren't. These probably, some of these may have been trying to crawl away or get away that are at the back after the shooting began, but this, this doesn't show the scene of, of something where there was a lot of shooting. This, is, uh, this map where you see these arrows is showing the description that one German gave of where he applied mercy shots to the people that were still groaning or alive in the field. So what really happened at Malmody? Well, there was a shoddy um, trial. That was bad. And that really created trouble that's, that's still going on now. Once you create, once a, a, a myth gets created, or an urban legend, or what? This is worse than an urban legend. Once something like this create, gets created, it's never, you never get rid of it. Uh, so the SS apologists further confused the matter. Eighty-four Americans were deliberately killed after surrendering to the SS. This is the key point. It was typical East Front methods. Here, so this is uh, this. We had lunch today, and we talked. We were talking about this with some others. And wh why did the Germans do this? Did, did they order each other to do this, like go shoot them? No, they didn't say anything because that's the way normal business was done in Russia. You just said, you know, straighten this out, get this done, move on, which basically went just take care of these people, get rid of them. So here, I'm going to read just this little bit that you can see up here. So you can, see. this is a, the testimony of one of these guys. He said, I entered the SS in November 1939 voluntarily and received uh, SS schooling in the concentration camp Dachau. From Dachau, I was ordered for the, about 10 days to the concentration camp Buchenwald. So these SS guys, not only this, you know, they're being trained at concentration camps, some of them. <clears throat> I again returned to the concentration camp Buchenwald and so on. Then at that time, I was under the command of the Totenkopf Verband. Uh, from the concentration camp, I was transferred in the middle of March 1940 to the LSSAH, the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler is what that uh, stands for, uh, to which I belong up to this time. This battalion is now called the 3rd. Since approximately the beginning of 1943, it was uh, called the 3rd Battalion. This was commanded by Captain Joseph Diefenthal and part of the 2nd Panzer Grenadier uh, Regiment. I will truthfully write down what I know about the shooting of civilians and prisoners of war. In Russia, generally, we did not take any prisoners at all. Most of the prisoners had been surrounded at the beginning of the war against Russia. When the fighting began heavier and the German advance slowed down, prisoners of war were only taken in special instances. 
On various occasions, we burned down whole villages with our blowtorches. We burned down whole villages. Especially, I remember two cases, one in the spring of 1943, when we expressively received the order near Kharkov to set a village afire and bump off all inhabitants, including women and children. When I say we, I mean the 3rd Battalion, which at that time was led by Hofstonefuhrer Piper, same fellow. His command was known as the Blowtorch Battalion. Now you know why it was known as the Blowtorch Battalion. They burned things to the ground. They set the cafe on fire. As a cafe burned, if anybody tried to leave that cafe, they were shot down. So our battalion at that time was cut off in Russia, and we operated on our own oftentimes. I myself did not see Hofstrumfuhrer Piper, who was with us at that time, shooting prisoners. However, this is an important point, it was generally known in the unit that he actively participated in this kind of action. So this was just normal way of life in Russia. So when, when, they, came to, when they came to fight in the Battle of the Bulge, there was actually a discussion, which is the, the Mr. Nice Guy way of fighting that we did in Normandy. There's no more of that. We're going to stop with the humane methods of war. And so we're going to go back to the way we fought it in Russia. But within the whole process, I've gotten to know a lot of, of great guys. I interviewed uh, more than a dozen of the survivors uh, at, that were at Malmody. This is one of the, the wonderful ones, uh, not only Bill Merrickin, who features so heavily in my story, but this guy, T5, Theodore J. Paluch. This is his testimony from 20th December 1944. You notice his picture isn't quite so good as the German pictures, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he does still have fairly good detail. And he describes, if you get all these accounts, you all square them away, you get so that you know you have, all, you, know, you have all these accounts describing the same thing. You get with kind of an ironclad picture of what happened. This is Ted Paluch, the way he looked when he, he actually wanted to, he wanted to be a Marine, but he had flat feet. So he went, to, he went down to, be in, uh, you know, to, to volunteer, and he was rejected. So he went home, and then he said, you know, I was only home for a few more months, and then you know, they called me up. It's like, you're in the Army now. So, <laughs> so anyway. He did tell me that, that when they were, they were in basic training that he had a bad feeling one time because they had they broke into teams and they would be you know, trying to capture each other. And he said, we got captured. And I had the strangest feeling about that. And he said, when we were captured at that crossroads, I had that same feeling again. Like, and I thought, oh my, maybe this is the feeling you have when you realize this is the end of your life. And you're having like a premonition about the end of your life. Because he, he told me, he said, you know, that, and he's still living today, still uh, lives in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, I think he, the reason he's still doing so well is he loves numbers. Ted Palooch really loves numbers. He likes to race, horse races. He loves that. He's, I think he's done pretty well doing it. But um, anyway, uh, he, he told me that when that all happened, he didn't know if he would obviously survive. He said he wasn't that scared until they jumped up and got up and ran, and then after he got away. I want to honor those who were there. And this is uh, Ted and myself, uh, and he wanted to find the grave of uh, Carl Stevens, who was a good friend of his, and Henri Chappelle. And we went around, and we found these different people that he knew. And then this is uh, the granddaughter of La Jolie. This is the house. He crawled through a hole in this hedge behind here to escape. And he just, he, uh, we took, she showed up and, he's, and he's, she said, oh, you know, it's my parents that own this house. And he said, oh, yeah, there used to be a pump right here where they pump water, a hand crank pump. She said, oh, yes, there was. It's been gone for years. But anyway, so uh, great to, to know these people. And then I, I you know, I want to dedicate this to George Fox, who I knew, another wonderful fellow. This is uh, just last May, just a year ago. This is Ted Paluch and George Fox meeting each other again. George died this uh, last November. Another, another great guy. And they're, you know, we're losing a lot of them. So important to uh, try to, to honor those guys. It's important to try to get their stories and to try to make sure that we preserve them. Relative to the, to the story, I want to show you the, the cover that never made it, too. You know, when I first said I'm going to do this book, they, they said, oh, good. That's fine. You know, this sounds like a good idea. But I already talked to the marketing people, and they don't want any dead bodies on the book. 
You make sure no, you say, we know we're going to have dead bodies inside. No dead bodies on the cover. I said, great. I think that's such a good idea. And then so this was the original cover, which showed this field off limits. And then later on, the marketing people came back and they said, we want dead bodies on the cover. <laughs> So that's how we, we finally ended up with that. I want to tell you about two important things. If you get a copy of the book on Facebook, you can find the Fatal Crossroads on Facebook. And uh, I have all kinds of new information that I post there every week or so, uh, more stuff than could be in the book, pictures, a lot of archival material, more interviews, of people that surface in, in terms of other information. And I like to share that with people, and it's available to you. Also, too, to close, if, if I'm still OK, on, we're still good on time, I want to read you just a very short piece from the book so you can hear about someone that we're going to talk about just a little bit more after I'm done. And this was a man um, named uh, Henry Zach. I want to give you a sense of what happened. I told you, you've got the basic facts now. OK, a lot of men got killed. And there was, the story was messed up after the war by a bad trial, and then messed up by re revisionist thinking going on uh, after the war, too, in Germany and so forth. And by, you know, uh, one of the bad things about revisionism is uh, then it becomes other people, rather than the German, you know, like it's bad enough that the old German guys were doing this, but what really upsets me these days is when, like, you have young kids who say, you know, that's not true, that never happened you know, whatever. You know, like, it's one thing if you're an old SS guy trying to defend yourself and say it didn't happen, but it's another thing to be like, you know, you're, you know, I don't know, um, what you call it, skinhead or someone like that, saying that these things never happened, that, that, you know, that's really kind of an insult. And that's one of the reasons to write the book. One of the things is that's happened so far, maybe you can be the first, but I haven't gotten a lot of criticism from those people. Why? Because if you look, if you notice, the book is about one-third documentation of where it all came from, right? If you look at it, like the, the story is about this long of the whole thing. The rest of it is where the story came from. And, and if you don't believe me, you can go look at it yourself. <laughs> and if you want to refute it, you've got a job to do. I hope you have 17 years. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> a lot of people, not just the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion were, were captured here. There was another unit. The, the, 30, the 32nd Armored uh, Reconnaissance Battalion from the 3rd Armored Division was headed down towards saint Vith coming down through this area, just behind what we see in this zone. And they didn't know that the Germans were, had already broken through the lines, and they ran into the Germans too. And they were in jeeps, and they, they were just driving the jeep, making a turn in the road, and they were faced suddenly by tanks. One of them ran into it. It's like, what do you do? Put up your hands. And then, so what happened to them? They ended up driving Jeeps at the front of the German column because you will drive the Jeep at the front of the column. So, and one of these was Henry Zach. What page? Uh, you can, oh, if you want to read along. Yeah, page 190. So, uh, these jeeps were uh, included a lot of members of the uh, some some members of the 32nd uh, armored regiment. So, but on page 190, after bouncing along on the German, so some of these guys were driving jeeps, and others were said, "You will ride on the tank, S sitting on the tank. You will ride on the tank. You will drive the jeep." So, so Zach was one on on a tank. He said, "After bouncing along on German tanks for nearly eight miles and over an hour long period." Staff Sergeant Henry Roy Zack, a native, of, a native of Burnett County, Wisconsin, found himself approaching an intersection where another task force had more than 50 prisoners already collected. Zack and the others of the Little Reconnaissance Company were then told to get off the tanks, hand over their cigarettes, and go into the field with the other prisoners. Zack did as ordered, placing himself into the swelling group of Americans at the crossroads behind a fence. Looking out, he was moved into something of a surrealistic reverie. What happens when you see you might be, your life might be over? Um, so uh, there were cold pines under a gray sky with wisps of mist obscuring the view at any distance. The entire group was understandably apprehensive. Some half-tracks were pulling up just as they arrived. 
not 70 yards away, and he, this is his voice. He says, there was considerable moving among the group as a whole. I was just brought back with my hands up, and they were shifting around, and somehow I got to the rear of the bunch, and I stayed there, and they brought up a half track and that I had a howitzer on it, and then they swung it right across the road, and they lowered it as if they could, they could not get the gun low enough to deflect to cover us, and then they brought up two more half tracks. Zach recalled that there were two half tracks directly across from the prisoners with another slightly further up. Lieutenant Ames, who was also with him from that reconnaissance company, was standing right next to Zach and could understand German. These guys were a lot of them from Wisconsin. He heard the Germans talking and suddenly turned to the sergeant and said, Zach, they're going to kill us. Zach could only nod as he watched the Germans train their machine guns on the group. He, Lieutenant Ames, and McDermott were standing close together just to north of the center of the group in the field. They were loosely aligned in rows, and Zach managed to get to the rear. We were not there long, he recalled, when they started firing. Although the, the prisoner standing in front of him with their hands held high partially obstructed Zach's view, he thought the first shot came from machine guns on the half tracks. When the firing broke out into the mass of prisoners, Zach threw himself face down on the ground with his head aligned away from the road. They all went right to the ground and like lightning, as instantly, as fast as you could. When the machine guns bullets started hitting them, they, he said they were like human dominoes. I thought it was a good time to fall and play dead, which I did. While he's on the ground, machine gun fire sprayed the men laying prone in the field. It went on for a long time. He thought for 10 minutes. A machine gun hit Zach in the right hip. When the machine gun stopped firing, I heard several large caliber guns go off, and it took several shots before one of them hit me. The doctors who later patched Zach up estimated that it was a 40 millimeter round that nearly tore off his left leg. But the nightmare was not yet done. Unlike most in the field, Zach had frontline combat experience with the 3rd Armored Division. After the first shots, he knew the Germans were going to try to get rid of them all. Many in the group were terribly wounded. Even so, he feared for everyone still alive when those artillerymen who survived began shouting back and forth. The Germans, armed with pistols, then came and killed all of the men on the ground who were screaming or moaning in agony. From his position just to the rear of the group, Zach could peer off to the right or left just enough to observe bullets being fired at men lying close by. He noticed that the Germans were kicking the Americans in the testicles. If they moved, they were shot. Zach had fallen lying face down, but he didn't move even a little when he was kicked hard in the rump. They just stood right next to and shot my lieutenant. He pretended to be dead, the same as I, but he didn't fool them. I guess because I, I heard them kick him, and they made him get to his feet. But I'll, I'll give that lieutenant credit. He was a man. He never begged or whimpered or anything. They just shot him in the head, and then he fell backwards, and he touched my feet. Some groaned after being shot the final time. Others gasped, sighed their final breath. Zach closed his eyes and pretended to be dead, not even moving, even though racked with pain. After the executioners left, there were more cries and moan, and then the Germans came back a second time. In the late afternoon, when dozens of Americans suddenly jumped up and ran from the tangle of bodies near the road, Zach was too badly wounded to join. He couldn't do it. He couldn't get up. His leg was almost blown off. He, could only, he couldn't use his left leg at all. It was hardly attached, dangling grotesquely by muscle and sinew on his side. And Lieutenant Ames' execution had shown him what would happen to anyone who showed signs of life. Then Zach had also watched some of the Americans run to the hide in the cafe or into the, uh, the cafe itself only to have the SS men set the building on fire. The reek of burning wood and sooty smoke permeated the air all afternoon, and still he heard occasional shots. Then his world got cloudy. Was he dying? Although he lost consciousness for a time, uh, he was still dimly aware of the burning cafe. I watched it all burning all afternoon. Lating, later after the Germans left, the sky grew dark. Then I heard no more groans or movement to indicate that anyone was left alive. He crawled away from the mass of dead towards the cafe. I can safely say I was the last person to crawl away from the bodies. I waited until dark, and then I went alone. Zach had crawled only a foot or so when he came upon the lifeless body of Lieutenant Ames by the hedge that separated them from the cafe. By then, the cafe was burning, or quiet, burning quietly to the ground, but Zach was so badly wounded, wet and cold, that they... Heat drew him in the direction of the burning building. He could hardly move. Near the end of his strength, he crawled underneath a sheet of galvanized roofing that lay near the glowing embers. 
I grew pretty weak, he said. I was bleeding quite a bit. Exhausted, he fell unconscious into a deep sleep. Zach awoke near noon the next day. Slowly opening his eyes, he was surprised to find himself alive. As if in a dream, he heard voices. Realizing he was near death, he called out with all his strength. I yelled out as loud as I could. I didn't care anymore. I took a chance. Amazingly, it was an American captain and two enlisted men who had chanced driving their jeep to the crossroads. Upon arriving at the scene, they were shocked to see a pile of dead bodies. Then the German civilians came out speaking so fast that no one could tell what they were saying. Yet that place was hot. The enemy was just around the corner. Lieutenant Captain Edward Schenck of the small American party heard Zach's cry. He discovered the severely wounded GI pitifully huddled under his plank of metal roofing covered by mud and ash. In their panic to leave, they used a corrugated metal sheet as a stretcher and hauled him into the Jeep. Let's get out of here, Schenck said, throwing the Jeep in gear. Seconds later, seconds later they sped off to the north, leaving, leaving the two Belgian men behind, still imploring them with urgent hand gestures, although grievously wounded, Henry Roy Zach had survived the Malmody Massacre. And Zach was one of the people that I, I interviewed. Zach was also uh, someone who was uh, with the round table and with this community and up until uh, recent years. So, but anyway, I, uh, this gives you, you know, without reading the rest of the book, you already have a flavor for a lot of what happened. But I really want to uh, extend my appreciation for your attention this evening. And uh, I very much appreciate um, all the veterans, that uh, many of them who gave the ultimate sacrifice are no longer here to be with us. So thank you very much. Danny, if you could do one thing. Yes. The questions that I've asked uh, Jerry Noss, who is in the middle, proud of his first division heritage and Murrow Bergstaller with the 6th Armored. How did you hear about the Malbody Massacre? And then the next question is, what was the reaction to the troops at, upon hearing that? Jerry? All right, Don, you see all the white hair? I've been trying to think of what happened and I can't remember. Uh-oh. The chances are that I, I learned that from the um, from our uh, uh, we I call him a, our chronicler because uh, he knew a lot what was going on and he was part of the uh, TNT um, grouping that we had, which would be telephone and teletype, uh, and he was who I considered the best uh, um, operator. Uh, switchboard operator that we had, and so he had ample time to probably listen in on some things that he probably should not have. Anyhow, um, my guess is that that's where I learned it from. Now, what was the reaction of our guys when we heard that? And uh, uh, well, I would say almost with without any exception at all that it, you, you think of Okay, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I mean, there was just going to be no mercy uh, spread on any the, to the Germans at all. And uh, um, that's what I would say. Uh, that's that's the reaction. I, I know of no other, you know, at that particular time. We were shocked. We, we were scared of a lot of things, though, that were going on because this was some, n another time. So um, it was it was a time of uh, of uh, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of rumors because of the uh, Germans having dropped down the parachutists you know, who were in the in the area and and in behind the lines and raising havoc. And and the the, the group that uh, Jerry is talking about is the Scorzini group. Uh, and and uh, that's going to come up here in a moment. I have a little story about him. All right. Uh, he, uh, he he dropped down and he was hurt, you know, uh, when he came down and he had a few men with him. And um, uh, as he came out of the forest uh, or he was in a wooded area and uh, 
he <clears throat> he heard track vehicles, and he was so happy because he thought, sure as the world, this was the um, the arm Panzers, and uh, so he, he sneaked up to the road and uh, and he waited until sure enough the tanks came by, but. Uh, his heart dropped because he saw the big red one. First Infantry Division uh, tanks were coming toward the front. But but the uh, the message came into the uh, signal company's uh, comm center of, of the Malvady Massacre. Yeah, that's how that's how I found, I'm assuming that's how I found out. Merrill, uh, I can never remember, you were in the 777th? 777th. We called it the Triple, triple Hooks. A. Triple Hooks. Anti-aircraft Anti artillery. For the um, 6th Armored Division. And um, Merrill, uh, I, I, I tell you, both of these gentlemen at an earlier time went on one of our tours to, uh, to Europe, and I, I can't tell you. Uh, what it was a great privilege to travel with them. But we traveled uh, down Merle's route uh, into, uh, uh, into Bastogne, actually, following the 4th Armored Division. If you recall, we did the program on the 4th Armored Division back in uh, December of this year, and we still have some of those books if you're interested. Merle, but tell us how you heard about the uh, uh, Malbany Massacre. Well, I'm glad that the gentleman on my left said he couldn't remember for sure. He's not the only one. I'll give you a bit of background. I was a 777th anti-aircraft artillery, self-propelled, all on half-tracks, permanently assigned to the 6th Armored Division. I like to say I was playing defense on the greatest offensive team in Europe. The 4th and the 6th Armored were two of Patton's favorites. Uh, as far as I know, he had the 4th, the 6th, and the 80th Infantry. I give you that background because I was the operations sergeant of the battalion. And I reported to a major who was S3, the third in command. S3 means that he was in charge of operations. And I'm almost certain that I heard the news through the major. Uh, the S2 was intelligence. The S2 and S3 operated very closely together. So I'm sure whether it came in through the intelligence officer or the operations, that's where I heard it. Um, do you want to ask any more questions? What, I, I, what, what, after hearing of it, what was your reaction or what were the uh, reaction of the GIs around you? My personal reaction was I was not going to give up very easily if the Germans surrounded me. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that time, I was carrying a German P-38 right here under my arm in a homemade holster. And I was going to use that if I had to as a last resort, although I was issued a carbine. Um, I think uniformly, our unit probably had the same feeling. Uh, it was a feeling of... Don't give up very easily. If you get your chance for retribution, don't think too much about it. And uh, I can go into one story. In 2007, when we went back on a tour of the uh, Battle of the Bulge, my two sons and I and Don and 19 others, um, we ran across a man and his wife who have a museum in Belgium. And I accidentally asked him the question. I said, I know in World War II that we caught some German soldiers 
speaking perfect English, wearing American uniforms over theirs, and they were misdirecting traffic and knew our passwords and just creating chaos and confusion. And I said I heard that they were executed without a trial, without any uh, talk about Gitmo or anything else. Don't bring them back to the U.S. They just lined them up. I think there were about seven. And this museum director said, I can show you right where that is. And Don, I think you went with us, didn't you? We walked down a little road and uh, through a trucking company parking lot and down in the back of the parking lot, and there was the, there the wall is. Now, these prisoners were had a hood put over their head, lined up against the wall, handcuffed in the back, and I think if there were seven executioners, if you want to use the word, uh, the practice was to have six with real bullets and one, bu one rifle without, and they passed the rifles out so that each man thought maybe his was just a blank. But that was the end of these guys. And my son-in-law asked me, what did you do with the bodies? I said, you know, we didn't care. I don't know what we did. We didn't do a thing with them. As far as we're concerned, they were just done for. Uh, I could relate... Two more stories. I, I want to add something okay. to that to okay. that uh, story, though. Okay. We did go to the wall, and the the wall still has the uh, marks where the bullets penetrated the concrete. And it's not as accessible as it used to be because a fence was put uh, very close to it. But some of us did go down and uh, uh, get a closer look at the wall. Uh, go ahead. Um, in terms of attitude, one day I saw a truck rolled over on its side, and there was a American-clad soldier. Turned out he had our uniform over a German uniform, sitting on the frame of the truck, frozen to death, but he was headless. Uh, I think some of the GIs who caught him just didn't like that. Um, I had one other incident that I can tell you about. One day I saw out about a, qu a quarter of a mile away across a field, I saw a parachute fluttering in the breeze. And I saw a soldier lying on his elbow and I approached him cautiously because I was curious and leery. And as I approached, I realized he was dead. He was frozen in that position. And he again was a German paratrooper. Apparently he had broken a leg or something in landing and never got up. It was cold enough that he was uh, frozen to death before he could do much about it. Um, you, When you're in battle and you're in the front lines, as we were, the 6th Armored was front line for 221 consecutive days. And when the Armored Division was in combat, that meant that a lot of elements of the division had anti-aircraft support from us, and we shot down 111 German planes. But when you're in combat, you're living day to day and hour to hour, and you do your do job as best you can. You lose your friends, but you look forward to hope that you live to the next day and don't spend too much time or you'll go crazy if you think about what's already happened. You're talking about um, how many combat days did you, you had. I, 
thinking about uh, the 1st Infantry Division was uh, well over 400, but you know who had more combat time than that? It was our own 34th Division right here, here in Minnesota and, and surrounding area. Uh, I, I do have a I do have a question later on uh, for our speaker. Jerry has written a book. Jerry was uh, with the First Division Signal Company from D plus two or three six D plus six at Normandy all the way to Czechoslovakia, <laughs> and then he helped run the um, comma wire into the Nuremberg War Trials. But Jerry, uh, at the help of the 1st Division down in uh, uh, Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, Cantini. Cantini helped write this book. And, yeah. and Jerry has them for sale, and he will autograph them, just like Danny will autograph his book. So, uh, yeah. But you have another story? Well, the, re the reason was that my father was in World War I. And uh, I know very little about that happened to him, and and uh, uh, I tried to find out from St. Louis, and then it so happens that his records are one of the records of many that was destroyed. And so um, <clears throat> I told myself that if I ever have any kids of my own, uh, I mean, they're going to know something about it. So actually, I wrote it, and then. Um, in in forty seven, I had I had kept some notes, but I, in forty seven, I wrote it and I put it away. I had eighty six pages typewritten, single space, and that was the heart of the story. Uh, when I approached, it was only through, John, well, no, no, uh, John um, Bota, who was here from from the uh, museum. Uh, he was visiting a friend of his who was talking here, here th that night, and I, so I found out that he was uh, from the uh, first division uh, uh, museum, and so I approached him and asked him about uh, the possibility of writing a writing a book and uh, that uh, or, or they producing it, and um, uh, he said, "Well, he says, have you have you this on tape or do you have it on CD?" And I said, "Well, I can put it on a disc." And so he said, "Send it to me." And uh, four months later, I got word from him, "Okay, we're going. We'll take it." And the reason was because uh, I have a lot of details in there because they were fresh in my memory yet. And so uh, the other thing is, there really isn't anything written about uh, signal. Uh, equipment and uh, much to do with that, so uh, that's the reason why they published it. Great. Uh, one of the other people that we had hoped to have on the uh, veterans panel this evening is a gentleman by the name of Walter Halloran. Uh, Walter was on our was our speaker back in '96. He uh, it was in the days when when World War II veterans were plentiful. Uh, he came here, I handed him the mic. He spoke for about an hour and 20 minutes. His daughter came up to me after the program and said, my dad had never told me anything about this. Briefly, Walter was a combat photographer he had landed on um, Omaha Beach ahead of the uh, infantry landings. He was the combat photographer for the Remagen Bridge, and he got to know Colonel Pergren at that point. Um, he had a connection to the uh, Malmody Massacre in January, he was called up to photograph an awards ceremony of General Ridgway pinning awards on some other GIs. He was a part of the 165th Signal Photo Unit. It had about 180 people, and uh, they were dedicated to the 1st Army, which is the unit that uh, Jerry uh, and uh, Merrill were part of. <clears throat> he, uh, 
While he was uh, photographing this awards ceremony, and when it was completed, somebody said, uh, we, we need to take you out to a place near Malmody here, and, and the awards ceremony was in the Malmody area, of, uh, and, and have you take some pictures. And I, I can't tell you that, that Walter was the first on the scene, but he was early on the scene and took the first pictures of the Malmody massacre. Uh, following this and, and other things at, uh, in, during the Battle of the Bulge, he was also one of the first photographers in the Buchenwald concentration camp. Uh, later was captured by the Russians and uh, held for a few days before liberation. But Walter uh, and, and uh, we, um, we have to understand, we now call it PS, post-traumatic stress syndrome, PS. But he said, uh, as, as he approaches his 91st birthday, said he can't talk about some of those things too much because it brings back memories and he doesn't sleep well. So he authorized me to, uh, to tell that story. Could you pass the mic down? You, you, you see Howie back at the desk and uh, uh, greeting you at most of the programs. But we had uh, Colonel Pergren, who was the commander of the 291st Engineer Battalion. He built the floating bridge at, uh, at Remagen. And uh, uh, am I pointing this right? There we are. And uh, as uh, Danny mentioned, he was down here. And I think he was actually going to defend this road, right? The, the, they, they, didn't they cut down trees? Charged on trees and, and broke the trees down. And uh, I, I've driven this road many times. There's still a lot of trees there today, but uh, that was down. But uh, Danny related the uh, comment that uh, he told the people not to proceed down the road. When Colonel Pergren came to speak at this roundtable in this facility, I think it was in 1990, how I can correct my failing overloaded memory. Uh, we were leaving the next day for our first battlefield tour. And so I uh, asked Howie if he would um, take Colonel Pergren and we arranged for him to drive up and meet with Henry Zack up in Wisconsin. And so Howie is going to relate uh, that day, the drive up, the meeting with the two of them, and the drive back. Howie. Thank you, Ben. Well, we uh, were met at the door by, by Ruth, uh, uh, Henry's wife. And after some introductions and some, uh, some casual talk, we sat down and talked for about, uh, about two hours. And then Ruth had a dinner for us. And the dinner was down, I just, excuse me for saying this, but it was roast beef, mashed potatoes and gravy, corn, and homemade bread and coffee. And so it was a wonderful dinner. So then after dinner, we all sat down and started going over some of the, some of the uh, things that happened to Henry in, in the war. And uh, finally about uh, 2.30 uh, in the afternoon, Henry said, well, he said, I'm kind of getting tired now. And I said, I think I, I, I want to uh, quit and I want to take a, a, uh, a nap. And so Dave and I got up and we said our goodbyes. And so we got in the car and started back for the Twin Cities. And as we were coming down uh, 35, I happened to look up uh, or over at Dave. And I said, uh, uh, Dave, I said, uh, uh, is there anything wrong? And tears were coming down his eyes. And he said, he said, I'm going to read this now because I think I can read it better than I can tell you. He said, uh, uh, his, his, his speech kind of left me really, really speechless. And he said, Howie, he says, I was responsible for those kids dying in that field. I should not have let them leave Mamadi. Lieutenant Larry and 
and Captain Mills both insisted they had orders to proceed to St. Beth, and, and so I let them go on. And uh, he said, I've re regretted that decision all my life. I could have prevented the deaths of over 90 soldiers. And the tears were just, tears were just coming down. And so I looked over at him, and I still didn't know what to say because it was just caught me by surprise, too, that a man here was almost in his 80s and crying because he thought he was, he was responsible for those kids' deaths. And so uh, uh, after about a half hour later, we were coming down to the cities, and he said, Howie, he said, uh, uh, he thanked me for being a good listener, and he said for being a good friend. And it was kind of funny because uh, about a year later, I got a Christmas card from him, and the card just said, thanks. And that's mine. And uh, I, I think, Danny, you said that uh, Colonel Pergren is still alive, but in, a, in an assisted living? A year or so ago. So, But... Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you were here when Colonel Pergren spoke, but that 291st w was a great unit. If you look at the reading list uh, in the round tablet that uh, that uh, Joe and uh, Connie put together, we meant, there's a book called The Damned Engineers, and uh, that is a it's a very hard volume to find, but it's a great history of uh, of the uh, of a really a decorated engineer unit. So anybody in the engineer corps should read that for sure. Now, if you remember the assignment that I gave you at the beginning, I'm going to walk up this aisle, and then I'm going to walk up this aisle. And this is not to ask questions. This is, do you, as a, as a World War II veteran, did you have any recollections of the uh, hearing about the Malibu Massacre. Ray? Ray Nagel was actually in Bastogne, uh, surrounded, waiting for relief. Is that right? No, that's not right. <laughs> we, we were... <clears throat> we were encircled uh, in Bastogne, 101st Airborne, and we went in by truck. Uh, it was uh, snowing and bad bad weather, and uh, we made it up in there, and we went by where this massacre took place, uh, but there were no no dead soldiers there. They had taken them out already, but uh, we were artillery supporting 506, most of the the whole from Normandy on, and. Uh, with artillery, and uh, we never had any problem at all. Never, f we never f shot a shell short and killed any of our own troops. We got forward observers up there, and they said they never had any trouble there. But uh, we killed a lot of Germans. One day they tried to break through with us up in there, and uh, they didn't have any artillery, but they just sent the troops in and uh, they kept coming and coming, and we opened up. We only had six guns and two two battalions of six guns, and they were coming so fast that we called in the, the British, and they put in 105 artilleries and shot over our heads, and we were, sh there was, uh, we were including 105 artillery pieces, and not a one got through, and then the next day, we found out that we killed 7,000 Germans in one, one hour and 15 minutes. But that's, that was the biggest deal in the Army. Well, did, did, did you hear about the Malmody Massacre yourself? Yes. We went by there, I think, a day or two later, and uh, we, we stopped in... Any other veterans here that might have a, a memory of that? Anything on the other side? Okay, let's open it up for questions. Uh, Danny? Yeah, go, go ahead. Mike. Okay, Danny, can you come up here? 
I, I, I mentioned the story to you, uh, and, you know, about um, how, how the reaction you know, for the um, um, the, in, the invasion. This was on on the 16th of December when um, <coughs> um, two of our lieutenant colonels got a word from uh, the uh, corps commander, who was Hubner at that time, and he wa had been our first division uh, uh, general. And he, he asked uh, these two uh, lieutenant colonels, he says, I want you to go out to uh, Elsenburg, where the uh, uh, 99th CP is, and he said, and find out what the story is. This was on the 16th now. And the two girls went there, and they found that they saw the, uh, um, the officers there were, were trying to locate where their men were, and so, I mean, this was a confusing time. So, <clears throat> uh, anyhow, uh, uh, Colonel um, Sutherland was a impeccable dresser, and uh, he, he looked like he came out of the Civil War. He had a, a fire red hair and a long uh, handlebar mustache, a pretty impressive guy. And C Colonel Murdoch was a third battalion uh, commander, and uh, and uh, they heard some noise outside, and here it was uh, some uh, armored unit that was coming by, and there was a lieutenant, no. Uh, uh, um, one-star general uh, leading them. And so they tried to persuade the one-star general to stay because they were quite sure that the first division was going to be in this way, uh, coming here soon. And we were only, you know, about 20, 25 miles away. So anyhow, the general said, no, he had uh, his orders and he had to follow them. And so uh, they went back to uh, Corps and reported. And uh, that night, uh, we left, and so on the 17th, we we, we got back in, and we, we we were back in the area of the 99th. And so, so that's, th that's you that's you moved you moved up into position on Elsenborn then, supporting the 99th. 99th. Yes. Any other questions? I'm curious what your understanding of uh, McCarthy's role was in the hearing afterwards. I, I, somewhere in my readings, I've been led to believe that he was an apologist for the Germans. Uh, yes, he, he was. McCarthy was an apologist for the Germans. Uh, and exactly why that's the case, I, I can't really, you know, that's a... Uh, I, I read some biographies. Uh, you know, he, there's a large German contingent in uh, Wisconsin where he was from that he was playing to, but I don't think that's the sole reason. I, uh, he, he was also good friends with a woman. Her name was Frida Utley, and uh, these, uh, the Frida Utley was uh, s strongly anti communist, strongly anti Russian. And this, this was a kind of an understood position in the, the developing Cold War. And so I think uh, McCarthy saw being anti-communist, anti-Russian uh, as being a good thing. And the Germans were certainly anti-communist, anti-Russian. So that, you know, that's my assessment of why it en ended up that way. And it, it was a reason that the Malmody men were never executed because they were sentenced to hang. and in 1949, right when all this was, was, was going on, when the Senate hearings got started and the, the army was told to stay the executions and all the rest. So it's a complicated thing. Another question here. This is for Danny. Uh, maybe you can shed some light on uh, something I've read and heard about from time to time. Uh, an actor who died recently, Charles Durning, has been reported some places. He was one of the survivors at Malmody, and some have said, no, he wasn't. Do you know the facts on that? Well, um, you know, I don't want to create a big stir, but it, as far as I know, he was not. You know, the, the, he was not with the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion, nor was he with any units that were involved in the massacre. From what I understand, Durning never claimed to have been at the Malmody Massacre. He claimed to have been at a place 
where American soldiers were shot, and there were a number of these type of incidences, not just Malmody. So, you know, we can't really say for sure. Uh, I think what I've, I was contacted by the Washington Post on exactly that question after Durning's death, and I, I told them my take, which was there's no evidence that he was there. And you'd have to ask the family if you really wanted their position. And then otherwise, you'd look for a 201 file and see if it survived the St. Louis fire. So, you know, as far as I know, though, he was not. This also is for our author. You did a lot of interviews. I'm curious about the interviews with the German participants. And, you know, were there some who you found who wouldn't speak to you? And what was the tenor and the attitude with the German? It, it was difficult. Um, and there, were, there was one interview uh, where uh, the fellow who was speaking to me said, oh, you know, this is difficult for me just to hear your voice. So, you, you know, I, I have really bad feeling about Americans. And he said, he said but you're not Bill Clinton. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what that meant, it really. But, um, you know, he did speak to me. He just said that the sound of my voice really bothered him. He had been a prisoner uh, after the war, um, and I had some who would, you know, uh, you know, would lie to me, would tell me things that I knew were not true. But th I also found that, you know, I went to some of the reunions. I had a professional Austrian interpreter, and he really knew the way, you know, he really knew the way things were. And so one of the key things to do was start drinking. So, so, so start them drinking. You need to drink too. And so the, the idea was you should have pretty full belly and you should drink along with them, and, but you should make sure that you're providing them with all they wanted. And then, uh, you know, my Helmut, who was my interpreter, I remember we were speaking to one guy and he was, he was telling us some pretty interesting things. And then suddenly Helmut said to me, he said, he's lying to you now. He whispered in my ear and he said, but keep asking questions. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, I was I was thinking before I started this that I would interview some Germans and they would tell me um, I was young it was terrible what I did I really regret it and it's or it's awful for me to remember now and I don't want to talk about it and I to be honest I didn't find much of that I found uh, very different perspectives from the participants usually which. Well, even from the two that I showed you where they admitted that these things happen, uh, it, was, it was pointing blame on, on the individuals that were involved, saying it was their fault that all this happened. Or, the Ameri or an, another thing, that you won't enjoy hearing this, but they said the Americans were undisciplined standing in that field. And, you know, they weren't, they weren't standing still as they should and holding their hands exactly the way they should, and that was the reason we did this. But, of course, this makes no sense at all. You know, do you shoot people because they're not exact, acting exactly as you think that they should? So, um, but I, I did make a big effort to interview uh, German participants, and as I wrote in the book, I feel like a number of them probably will feel like I betrayed their trust because I described the way things the way the chips fell in terms of uh, the way the story appeared to me. And that was, there was, it was impossible to say that these guys weren't guilty. Yeah, uh, my dad was part of the 11th Armored Division. They had their first combat like the 28th or 29th of the month. He was involved with a situation where they took, he and another guy got four prisoners and brought them back. And then they ended up uh, being ordered by a different platoon or these guys ended up getting shot. And I was just wondering if there were orders out not to take prisoners or if this was just something that was uh, done in the heat of the moment. Well, there were, there were orders in the 328th Regiment of the 26th Division not to take SS prisoners, no SS prisoners. And I, I don't remember the date of that order, but it was later in December. There's somebody does, evidently. But... Um, uh, uh, I think that there, you know, as the the people that were involved know, uh, and even Piper him said said wars are not fought with kid gloves. You know, when you, in one of the things that you saw in Saving Private Ryan, I think that made that movie so compelling was you see more of the reality of what things are like. You know, wars are not nice things, and so there, you know, when you see friends dying, 
often it's going to be very difficult to take prisoners of people who just did what you saw. So this happened to some extent on both sides, and so the Germans would always tell me about that, that Americans shot prisoners too. However, here's the key difference. They did not shoot them in mass. They did not shoot you know, a lot of people that had already surrendered and had no weapons. Sometimes you know, there were cases where prisoners weren't taken, which is different from shooting prisoners. So um, you know, you have to think about that a little bit, perhaps. But there wasn't there. It. I'm not going to say that there that we didn't do some of this same sort of stuff at different times. And the website for Fatal Crossroads, there are two incidences. One involved the 11th Armored Division near a town na named Chino. Chino, it looks like. And so you can read more about that. And then some another incident hap happened uh, near. Uh, I think uh, a town called uh, Heppenbach up in uh, up in the north that involved the 82nd Airborne. Um, so, but that incident, the the Germans did grab weapons, and one of them shot someone, and then they shot a lot of them down. So anyway, uh, if you want to learn more about that, there's a website. But yeah, these things did happen. Another question. Uh, question for Mr. Parker: What whatever happened to Lieutenant Colonel Piper? And has there been any books written well, that's about the, his experience in the German military? Well, that's what I've been working on. And, you know, to be honest, that a book I will doubtfully ever see print in my life. Um, it, I've, the story I've written about him and his total war experience is about 2,500 pages. And no one's going to read that, not even me. So, <laughs> but the, the, a short, much shorter book about his life and about the things that are most interesting about him, we'll see print in about a year, and it'll be called A Deadly Past, but it really won't deal with the war, the war that much. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but basically I f I, one of the true treasure troves of my research over the years was finding letters that he wrote from the, from the war front during the war, and the family was really unhappy that I found these letters. But these letters tell you a lot without having to describe a lot about the war. So anyway, that they'll appear in that book. And, but can, uh, can I just uh, probe a little farther? Uh, did he die of natural causes? He or did was not it? die of natural causes. Uh, he was murdered by persons unknown on Bastille Day, uh, 14 July, 1976. And so one of the things I thought also in working on a book on him was I could turn it into a whodunit. Since no one knew who killed him, I could figure that out. And if I did, I'd have a great book. So, but you know what? If you do figure something like that out, it may not work out the way you thought it would. <laughs> so, so, so um, I do cover that, like who done it, and that's in the last chapter of the book. But I'm not going to say anything about that because I'd like you each to buy a copy. <laughs> and, and again, not to take anything away from your future book, but if you if in the reading list of the round tablet, uh, one of the uh, I think really fine articles that, that maybe you can comment on. The Devil's Adjutant by Michael Reynolds. Uh, General Reynolds is a friend of mine. Uh, I've known General Reynolds for years. Uh, he's written the most sensible things that have appeared in English. There's another German author. His name's Jens Westermeyer, who's written a book that was published by Schiffer. It's not the best book in English, but it's actually a pretty accurate book. But um, Reynolds' treatment is as fair as one could uh, could hope. Maybe even a little too fair uh, to the German side, but. Um, uh, yeah, you know, the devil's adjutant's a reasonable, a reasonable accounting of the story. Another question here. Mr. Parker, my dad was in the 82nd Airborne and went by the bodies of, uh, and he said when he saw them, they were tagged. And he said he swore that he saw a... Uh, helmet with a medic implement on it. Were there any medical personnel there, or was that part of the team afterwards? He, that he was right, and the name of the man with the medical brassard and the, uh, on the helmet, um, this was Ralph Indelicato, who was shot, and he was taking care of a man. You know, in the, when the Germans first encountered the Americans coming down that road, they fired on the column, and some of them fired back. I mean, with their carbines or pistols. And then I, then I remember speaking to Bill Merrick, and he said, 
I had this captured German pistol, and I took it out, and I was thinking, and I was shooting, and he said, they have tanks. I have a captured German pistol. <laughs> so, so he said, not only did he decide, this is crazy, he said, I can't keep this. And so he stuck it in a wood pile of a house that was close by and was happy to put his hands up and said, well, I guess Christmas is going to be no good this year. But um, two men had been wounded in the immediate encounter, and that not bad wounds. So they were being treated by Ralph and Delicato. Uh, Ralph uh, ministered to one of those men who was Carl Stevens, who you saw Ted Palooch and I by his grave in, at Henri Chapelle. He was ministering to Carl Stevens. The Germans allowed him to uh, fix him up, and then after that, they were all shot. So um, this did happen, and yes, he's, what he saw was correct. Another question here. At Melmody, isn't there a wall with the names on it? But I don't remember, I, I don't recall it. I don't recall 84, but maybe they were, uh, maybe there were that many. There was like a rock wall with, I have a of okay. I think there were 84, and, you know, in the book I go through describing how there was one guy on that that probably shouldn't be on that, but, you know, then I found out that those, that the people in the Monuments Commission, they're really fast, because I said that, and it appears in the book saying that should be correct, and it's already been corrected, so, you know, it's, the numbers are right on the monument. It's, I think it's still 84. Because there was one fellow, John Cobbler, who was wounded at Malmody and then got to a medical station, but then died there after after getting back. So in, there was one fellow that shouldn't have been on there. But anyway, so it got all got corrected, but it's still 84. Well, the the other thing, wasn't there a couple of people that were missing that were supposed to have been there? Um, I think there are people that are missing that we that we never found, that right. that have never been found. Like uh, so, some some of the guys that were wounded uh, moved to Belgian houses, even though they were wounded, and then were captured by the Germans, but not executed. But they were then moved somewhere we don't know. But then they they died, and they you know they're still missing in action today. We don't know. One of the bodies was found in Newhoff, Germany, which is uh, 40 miles away. So he must have passed away, and then it was buried by the road or something. We don't know the exact circumstance, but there's one or two men, men and I can't remember the exact number, uh, Don, that are still missing in action today, and we just don't know what happened to them. They disappeared. So Yes. I don't know whether you want to answer this or not, but did Piper ever give any explanation for this thing other than a standard, a standard operating procedure on the Eastern Front? You know, he he always was able to use the defense that I was not there when the shooting began. But here's the key thing. If you look in the book or read it carefully, or I'll just tell you now, he was there three or four minutes before it happened. So he was there three or four minutes before it happened, dressing down his second in command and telling him, what a crap job he was doing here at the crossroads, getting all these beautiful trucks sh shot up that they needed. And why was everybody sitting around smoking cigarettes and eating American biscuits? They should be headed down the road. So he left. Two minutes later, everybody's shot. So, and he, years later, he said, I don't even know what happened, and no one really knows what happened. Again, 84 Americans lost their lives there. It happened. And then late, it, he said different things at different times. He was pretty good at that. So he said, you know, my men were really young, and they were kind of uncontrollable, and a lot of had seen their families blown up in Cologne and all this, and so I couldn't control them, and they weren't the same caliber as the people I had before, which wasn't too nice to his own people, but he said they weren't the same caliber of what I had before. So anyway, the story has changed, but... Um, you know, I don't think he was able to deny that nothing happened. You know, then the, the after the war, the the defense began like we were abused at Swabish Hall while we were held before the trial and all this other smokescreen stuff is what I call it, which is just a way of saying, you know, we, we there's other problems we want to have. He hated the German general staff. He considered the he considered those guys. He called the red stripe crowd because they had red stripes going down their pants leg. He said they were a reason that we lost the war because they all would sit around smoking cigars in headquarters and then didn't really know what it was like to fight on the front. So you know he was 
he was uh, an arrogant guy. So, Danny, I'm, I'm going to make this be the last question. Tommy, you got something? So all of those were accounted for uh, essentially. So so everybody everybody and some escaped at the beginning when the Germans first encountered the column. Then there was only th three tanks, two tanks, two tanks and two half tracks. They a lot of them surrendered, and then the, that tiny contingent continued on. A fraction of the men managed to escape to the woods by. Since the Germans were gone, they took off, like, you know, get to the woods. And then a, a another larger number were convinced to drive trucks, the, the beautiful trucks that Piper wanted to capture. He convinced a bunch of Americans to drive those trucks for him, and so they drove away with the Germans, and then they later became prisoners of war. So, you, but you still end up with about 50 that still got away from the the crossroads and th when they jumped up someone said as bill american said he said i thought i thought i was the only person alive and somebody said let's go and uh then i realized somebody else was alive and he said he couldn't believe it that suddenly this heap of men that were there started moving and people got up and they were some people ran like rabbits really fast and others were like he were really badly wounded and Bill American, for instance, his story, you can read about it, but he, only one leg would work. So he hopped, just like you would be a kid playing hopscotch. He hopped on one leg away from the crossroads. That's, you can't hop very fast. So one of the Germans that were still at the crossroads brought out a pistol and tried to shoot him. And from a distance of from here to there, pointed the pistol at him, fired, the pistol misfired, click. And so he just kept hopping and then eventually found the stable, moved inside of it, and it was getting dark, and the German couldn't fall, find him. So these things happen. It was, it was really a crazy incident when that mass of men jumped up and tried to run. Others, like Henry Zack, were so badly wounded that they couldn't get away, and then they were, they were later rescued uh, by some of Peregrine's people who came up there and made the chance to, to rescue them. So... The last thing I want to tell you, though, I do want to tell one vignette before Don's ready to stop me. But I w one of the things I want to tell you is that even though we look at, at this time in World War II when these guys were fighting, uh, we think about it like we understand it today. But at that time, things were so uncertain. No one really knew what was going on. And like these guys will tell you that, you know, for soldiers in foxholes and soldiers back wherever they were, you know, they didn't, you know, they only knew what was going on with their buddies and everything. It was just big confusion, but it was confusion at every level, <laughs> okay? It was confusion all the way to the White House. So Franklin Roosevelt, after this thing happened, word came from George Marshall, the head of the army, the Germans are shooting prisoners. And so Roosevelt said, Maybe, we said, that's bad, but maybe it'll give our men more resolve to fight. But then he really became worried because some, and we still don't know the story of this because some of this hasn't been, been declassified, but a, uh, an agent that the Americans had working behind German lines had found out that somehow the Germans were, were supposedly working on an atomic weapon. And Leslie Groves, who had been in charge of this top secret mission that now is declassified, called the Alsace mission, had determined that the Germans were not close to an atomic weapon. And he had reported a year before to Roosevelt, don't worry, no atomic weapons. Germans aren't close. They're working on missiles, but no atomic weapons. Then, but he, then Roosevelt got some news from an agent or agents that actually the Germans, that that may have been a ruse and that they were close to an atomic weapon. And at the Battle of the Bulge, he looked and said, this is really bad, right? The Germans are fighting a delaying action. They're trying to stop us. They're pr probably preparing an atomic weapon for use. This shows the level of uncertainty that existed. And it looks like that the Germans were working on, an, on a weapon. It was not a nuclear bomb. It was a dirty radioactive bomb. But if it could have been landed on London, large part of London would be uninhabitable. But anyway, 
I'll stop there. No, I, I want to ask one other question. Malmody was the first of several massacres. At Lingleville, there were seven black troops, American troops, that were killed. And there's a monument there. There were some civilians <clears throat> that were killed in Stavelo. Uh, with, with regard to the Piper uh, specifically, how many deadly incidents were there? There were uh, about a, a dozen Americans killed in the village of Hansfeld. There were six Americans who were marched up onto the back of a hill near a village called Lavaux Richard. It's on the way to Stavelo. They were shot. The eight Americans were shot in um, Lignaville that you're mentioning. But the bla eight black ones were in another village called Wereth, the 330, 333rd Field Artillery, uh, Field Artillery Battalion. Uh, and there's a documentary on that now. Um, but anyway, we're at, and then there were over 100 civilians killed in Stavelo and the little hamlets by it. So everywhere these guys went, they were killing people. And meanwhile, most of the other German forces in the bulge, luckily in Bastogne, the people that you're faced with, at least they weren't executing people. But everywhere these guys went, you know, Hitler's own, they were killing people. So they were, they were doing things the way they had done them in Russia, which is you kill everybody. And the idea was, uh, Piper had been trained that uh, if you fight like Genghis Khan, you never have to fight because everyone's so afraid of you when they hear you're close by, they run because you kill everyone. And so that's the way they did things in Russia. Like everyone will be terrified. You burn down everything. You kill everyone. So ruthless. Howie had something. When I was talking to Henry at his house that day, I said to Henry, I said, you got a fabulous story to tell. Why didn't why didn't you write it down or why do you have memoirs or something? And he says, Yeah, I got them around someplace, but he says I sent them to some hospital or some veterans place. And so I said, Would it have been the Wisconsin Veterans Museum down in Madison, Wisconsin? Is that's one of the places. And so for like a couple bucks you can see the whole transcript of Henry's personal history. It's really interesting. Well, listen, everyone have a great summer. As, as uh, you will recall, we just passed VE Day in the last couple of days. So happy uh, VE Day to everyone. Uh, we'll start up next September, and I will alert you. We're planning a trip to uh, Normandy next May. Uh, Danny, one of the things I'd like to give to you as a souvenir uh, from the round table is an engraved World War II roundtable to Danny Parker, personalized. So thank you for coming, and we'll be in touch. Thank you for coming. Underwriting for this program provided by... Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn dash ww2 roundtable.org Production services provided by Barrows Productions. <laughs>